So one of the things about writing this book, one of the ways I framed writing this was that it was a love letter to my city. I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I would see these names around town on street names, on schools, different buildings and institutions around the city, but I knew very little about who these people were. There were a couple of names that became more familiar as I got to maybe high school or even when I went to college, but it still wasn't really trumpeted in the city, that there were all of these amazing black women who had moved through this city and who had shaped the city that I knew and loved growing up and were part of what made Washington, D.C. become Chocolate City. So D.C. becomes the first major city in the United States to become majority black, and that happens in 1957. So it means a lot of black women in particular were moving to D.C. Um, during the late 19th and early 20th century. But one of the key parts of D.C. that I found so fascinating was how much of an established black community existed in Washington, D.C. pre the Civil War. So there are communities there that existed from 1790 onward. So there are churches, there are cleaners, there's doctors, there's community that's really built there so that when this larger migration happens, and for DC that migration largely happens between about 1860 and 1900, as opposed to when we kind of think of the Great Migration, which is a little bit later, like moving from kind of 1890 through 1930, that population increase happens almost immediately to Washington DC, and more specifically of black women. In fact, between 1860 and 1930, the population grows by 800%, right, which is a pretty substantial amount of people moving into a space and claiming this space and trying to shape it into this kind of black women cultural center. And I didn't know anything about this. And another thing kind of tipped me off that I was missing something, not just in what I was learning about my city, but about a history of the United States, histories of black women more specifically, was that I got to Oberlin and a lot of the women who I saw on street titles and street names and buildings also went to Oberlin College. So I felt like I was following in the footsteps of these women inadvertently, not knowing that this was this path. And of course, coming to know that Oberlin was a school that had an open admissions policy from its inception as the first school to have black women graduate from it in the United States. So people like Mary Church Terrell, I know there, Anna Julia Cooper, women who would come to be central figures in my book, who I was now encountering. So I got to grad school and I thought about what would I just love to research for the next 10 years of my life? Because there was a kind of commitment that you have to have to a dissertation that you're gonna live with these people for a very long time as a historian. And so I wanted something that it was gonna invigorate me, something that I was going to be able to connect to, but also to find what was untold and unheard. Looking for the missing pieces, looking for the missing women, looking for the missing voices. And so it's kind of an honor to be speaking today on International Women's Day to really connect how we celebrate and reject erasure of women's stories. And so I looked to the words of these women to kind of guide me as I began this. And I begin the book with the words of Anna Julia Cooper, who's commenting on what is unwritten about black women's history. She says, quote, all through the darkest period of the colored women's oppression in this country, her yet unwritten history is full of heroic struggle, a struggle against fearful, overwhelming odds that often ended in horrible death to maintain and protect, protect that which woman holds dearer than life. And in her words here, I found that notion of unwritten history, that there was a call to write, a call to contextualize her words, a call to understanding this, histori this history, or as I like to say, this history of heroic struggle, to put this into some kind of framing and to make it come alive, to enliven the city and to enliven it with the stories of these women. And part of this meant that I had to think about what are the conditions under which women in Jim Crow were experiencing the world? Was there something specific about the way that black women would encounter Jim Crow, that black women would encounter patriarchy, that black women would in, um, encounter these kind of rapid technological innovations that are also happening at the turn of the 20th century? And part of this was also saying, how do I engender this period? 
right? How do I think about this new Negro that comes to emerge? And I thought about the new Negro, which is a framework that I use in the book, as something that had always been framed to me as fairly masculinist, even in its deployment. Temporally, it's about the war, right? the interwar period. Um, between the end of World War I and the beginning of World War II, um, although we know authors and poets and things, but thinking about it as a way to talk about African-American masculine struggle and racial violence against, in particular, black men and boys. And although I think that that holds true in a lot of ways, you see the language of a new Negro coming from black women as early as the 1880s, that they're articulating some idea of newness, some idea of modernness that they're trying to get at. And they're also trying to say, we're here too, right? So earlier before we get to the 1980s where you actually get the proclamation, but some of us are brave, these black women are saying, right, that black women are part of this black experience. And part of the ways that racial violence in Jim Crow shows up is distinctively marked on black women's bodies. So African Americans in the late 19th and 20th centuries experience anti-blackness, racial terror, and racial subjugation in gender-specific ways. And so part of this book was trying to access that. And I think it's important in a moment like this to think about why we have to dig in in these gender-specific ways to understand the dynamics of anti-blackness, both historically and contemporarily. Right? Although women were victims of lynching, and other forms of non-sexual violence, the predominating historical narrative of racial violence from the Jim Crow era pivots around the lynching of black men. Right? So when we think of this idea of who was lynched and where racial violence was showing up, particularly if we're thinking about fatal racial violence, a lot of times, a lot of the work that we've seen, a lot of the work that had been done, particularly up until the last few years, really focused on black men and boys. Even though there are nearly 200, and now still counting, 264, I think is the number now, documented lynchings of black women occurred during the same period. The lynched, brutalized, and publicly violated black male body remains the primary historical signifier of this era of U.S. racial terror. While I do not seek to diminish the significance of this signifier, its preeminence as the singular signifier reinscribes a historical narrative in which we discuss black women as secondary or less violated victims of anti-black racial terror. Black men, women, and gender nonconforming people cohabited the spaces of anti-black racial terror. So part of this is also gendering or opening up the gender possibilities of who is the strange fruit right, that we see hanging from these trees that is violated and distinct. The scant, though gradually growing visibility of the battered, brutalized, raped, and assailed black female body in our collective historical memory propels a primarily histor masculinist historical narrative of African American lived experiences in the Jim Crow era. Masculinist framings of anti-blackness during Jim Crow also contribute to contemporary discussions about anti-black racial violence. Comparisons between the lynching of black men and boys during Jim Crow and the killing of unarmed black men and boys, such as Tamir Rice, Michael Brown, and Eric Garner, rely on a historical narrative of black men and boys as the primary victims of racial violence. Thinking about African American women and girls as victims and viable subjects during the New Negro era allows for us to understand how and why gender mattered and continues to matter in the operation and praxis of anti-blackness. This intervention does not stop at, quote, we must remember black women and girls as victims too, but shifts our lenses to consider critically the relationship between gender and anti-blackness. Right? And so to do this historically means going back and one, digging through these archives and recovering these stories in which you see this violence happening, but it also requires understanding what is at stake if we don't. And we've seen this corrective contemporarily happen in thinking about a movement like Black Lives Matter that almost immediately gets a kind of update or remix with Say Her Name, right? An insistence upon the ways in which we remember and articulate black women and girls as victims of racial violence too. And so some of the work that these women are doing here, the women in the book, the women of Washington DC are doing, is asking us to say her name too. <laughs> 
right? So these become precursors of how we talk about gender, how we talk about blackness, giving us new frameworks and new ideas about this. So in this, I capture them as reinventing black womanhood, reinventing through reinvigorating discussions about what happens to black women and what are the unique conditions under which black women experience Jim Crow racism. Right? And part of this also is about using history as a way to think about meaningful resistance across time and how we don't make the same mistakes that we've made in past iterations of these movements. Right? So some of this is definitely, uh, as I was writing the book and finishing the book, Black Lives Matter happens as I'm finishing the book. And I see this kind of historical <laughs> corrective that is happening in real time. So instead of kind of 40 years later being like, hey, women were there too, women were victims too, right? It's almost this immediate response that allows for this using media and technologies of the time to address that and to talk about gender and anti-blackness. Well, in this era, they're using the media of their day. They're using print culture. They're using newspapers, right, to communicate these ideas among one another and create communities in which to actually engage these ideas about gender and anti-blackness. So although my book doesn't delve as much into violence um, here, a lot of the work that I'm doing here is shaped by the fact that the city experiences such tumultuous violence and these black women are trying to shape lives within that. So DC is one of the cities that's hit very hard by the 1919 race riots. Right? So there's an incredible amount of violence that's entering the city and these women are forging different cultural and political spaces to survive live, and in many cases, thrive, right, and on particular terms. So in the book, I broke it down into a, a couple of chapters, one being Howard University, which is what I'm going to speak about today. Um, another one was beauty culture. And part of this as a feminist was important for me to get at why was beauty culture so important to black women? It had this thing that seems more frivolous and kind of um, in certain ways, in certain framings, anti-feminist to think about beauty and something's wrong, so we need to correct it in you, but actually the ways that black women use this culture industry to make claims about womanhood, to make claims about blackness, to make claims about their political exigencies and their political futures. It's so important to black women that by 1920, 10,000 black women in DC identify as beauty culturist, right? And in some form, so they're, industries that are in salons out of people's homes, people doing other people's hair, people selling products, making products. There are ads on ads on ads of black women who advertise as Madam so-and-so, right? So you hear Madam C.J. Walker as a thing, but in order to kind of cash in on that cachet of that, every beauty culturist is a Madam. And every beauty culturist has its own kind of marketing or thing, something they give you for free with all of their services. And you see these in this whole kind of culture that forms in print culture around black women advertising their services. And then some madam madams, as in madams who are working in sex work, also use the madam title in the papers to advertise their services, but in a coded way. So you kind of have to read through and have a literacy of, is this a madam where I'm gonna get my hair done or this is a madam where other services will be rendered? Right, um, that happened. But all of this is happening in this kind of same page um, of these newspapers, of these black newspapers that become these important sites for discourses authored by black women about themselves. And it also becomes an opportunity to talk about what the black woman would be. What is the ideal black woman and black women having conversations about that and also listening to and engaging with some pretty awful kind of discussions about black womanhood, whether it's the editor of the Washington Bee demanding that black women straighten their hair, that God curse black women with kinky hair so that you should straighten your hair and go into the 20th century. You have that from the editor of the newspaper, right? But then you have someone like a Nanny Helen Burroughs pushing back saying, um, character, not color. Right, in order to kind of think about this. And you see how important this industry becomes and how financially viable this industry becomes, which then plays into how quickly things become regulated and companies bigger than these small madam operations come in to try and take over the black beauty industry. Right, leading up into the early 2000s where you have at one point 4,000 black manufacturers in the country at the height of some of this to four. 
right, by the 2000s, um, which is now increasing again, but there's this interesting move for 4004 because it's such a robust industry. The next chapter focuses on the suffrage movement in Washington, D.C. And one of the reasons I focused on this, although the history of the suffrage movement is very well documented by historians like Rosalind Turberg Penn, it was really important to think about what it meant to be part of an organizing community where the rights afforded to everyone else still wouldn't be afforded to you, even if black women were guaranteed the right to vote. Because D.C. does not have representation. Right? So what does it mean to organize politically for a community in a way that is absolutely, in certain ways, selfless, right? that won't have an impact directly on your representation in a broader sense at the legislative level? And you get to see the kind of comparative aspects of what women's suffrage movement looks like in black women's spaces and white women's spaces, right? What are the tactics? What are the aesthetic dynamics of it? What are the kinds of rhetoric that are being used? What are the political strategies that are being used? And so putting that into conversation with one another and using black women's words to dictate that. The last chapter looks at a community of writers in Washington because part of my book is also challenging the centrality of Harlem in thinking about the black cultural and intellectual renaissance of the early 20th century. And this also helps to push against the kind of temporal framing as well of it being an interwar period because there was a community of black women writers and most notably a large number of them was black queer women who were writing in DC during this period at the home of Georgia Douglas Johnson. And they would get together on Saturday night and they would workshop, work on pieces, give each other feedback. And it was not a women only space, right? But it was a space crafted by women that actually afforded a space for women to develop their voices as creatives. But everybody who was anybody in the Harlem Renaissance came through at some point. So there's Langston Hughes got his work cut to shreds there at some point. Um, Elaine Locke came at some point. And so there are different ways that this space is so much more important in terms of remembering what this renaissance actually meant and who those voices were. And also it became a safe space for black queer women in the 1920s, which is another important aspect of this community. And a large part of what they do in this is try their most radical topics. So they're looking at lynching, they're looking at infanticide. You have one of the first known plays about birth control Right, that are presented and written and authored in this space, so the kind of freedom that's created in this space. So you get a bunch of different snippets of who black women were in DC, connecting to this idea of what black womanhood could mean and the kinds of communities they would form. Today I'm gonna hone in, the time I have left, on Howard University, and specifically one of the women who helped to transform Howard University, um, Lucy Diggs Slow. And what's so, exciting about her is because she kind of is this dynamic figure that is now, I guess more people might know about her. Who many people have heard of Lucy Dixlow before? Excellent, okay, so no one except for one person, right? And who is this kind of phenomenal figure and checks off like so many historical pioneer boxes and she's unknown, right? So she is the first black woman to ever win a national championship in tennis. Um, she is, um, graduates from Howard University. She's the first dean of women at Howard University. She is a founder and um, first president of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, incorporated at Howard. Um, she is a writer. She is someone who advocates in student personnel. She brings forth the first known document of sexual harassment on a college campus that exists. So she's at the helm of all of these different kinds of movements and most of us don't know who she is. And what's interesting about her is that Howard becomes this rich space to develop her in certain ways because she's there as a student and then comes back as the dean. But it also is a space where she's doing an incredible amount of critique about the gender politics of Howard University. And so she's speaking both to the kind of larger kind of racial constraints of the city itself and of Howard, but then she goes into these intracommunal dynamics and calling out patriarchy and calling out sexism and ultimately calling out homophobia as her partner, um, Mary Burrell, who's an accomplished writer in her own right and part of the S Street Salon community, is um, her relationship is put into considerable limelight by certain administrators because she is a queer woman.
Right, so all the things, right? She's literally all of those things, and so little had been written about her up until this point. There's now a really amazing biography of her. It's extremely comprehensive. Um, and another work about her and her partner that's in a broader book of like gay cities and looking at Washington, D.C. as one of them, as one of the premier couples of the city. So I want to take a little journey through her journey at Howard and then get into some of the reasons and ways that she becomes this figure that gets lost and erased in the history, becomes part of unwritten history, and why it was so important to write her back into it. In 1933, which is near the end of her life, Slow stated, quote, regardless of the wish of many parents that their daughters become adjuncts of man, modern life forces them to be individuals in much the same sense as men are individuals, end quote. Lucy Dick Slow became the first official dean of women at Howard University in D.C. in 1922. The president of Howard at the time officially approved the establishment of this new administrative position. From 1920 to 19 to June 1922, Helen Tuck had served as the acting dean of women. The role and responsibilities of the position were not solidified until Slow's arrival. The job would mirror that of the dean of men position that the president approved a year earlier. Before accepting this position, Slow met with and wrote a detailed letter to President Durkee to discuss her expectations regarding the offer to serve the university in such a capacity. In a letter dated May 31st, 1922, Slow requested a salary of $3,200, a professorship in English through the School of Education, and a full-time office assistant. She also stated that, quote, all policies pertaining to the women of the university shall emanate from my office, but with approval from the president, end quote. This particular point of negotiation specifically unveiled Slow's desire to become a primary figure in the shaping of women's experiences at Howard. Before accepting the position of dean, Slow understood that the vitality of expansive, la excuse me, administrative latitude in her ability to prepare women students for modern life. This letter of negotiation established a foundation upon which a culture of contestation and transformation at Howard could evolve. So in addition to being part of the Howard community, she was also a woman who was quite involved in the national conversation around women on college campuses. She became a president of the National Association for College Women, which is an organization of black women who were in higher ed. Um, she had gone to Columbia after she attended Howard to study student personnel, which was a new and developing field that we now would look at as student affairs and what the student experience would look like, an administrative experience for her would be like. And so she there formed some really important relationships with other kind of leading white feminists at other institutions that would be some of her support during some of the rougher times at Howard University as she was going back and forth with the administration there. And she wanted to make sure that black women were receiving the kinds of education that would prepare them for the modern world. This became her life's work until her untimely death in 1937. Slow began, began her tenure as dean of women with the main goal of increasing possibility. Although pr Slow proudly served as a teacher for more than a decade before becoming an administrator, she expressed concern regarding the large number of college-educated African-American women becoming teachers. She did not discourage them from pursuing a career in education, but she vociferously advocated for the diversification of career aspirations among African-American women college students. So teaching and nursing were like two of the main fields that black women found themselves in. But teaching, for instance, particularly in the D.C. public school system at the time, if you got married, you were considered to have resigned your position. Right? There was no formal paper or anything. Your marriage was a letter of resignation. Right? So also realizing that even the careers where you thought there was this kind of noble possibility that put you in this place, right, the moment that you made a decision in your private life, it automatically cut you off from this kind of, uh, from this career path. So noticing that, she was like, how do we diversify this? How do we equip black women to be in all fields of endeavor and to also change that policy? For slow to equip black women for the demands of the 20th century meant exposing African American women to disciplines such as psychology, economics, and sociology, which could lead black women down new paths of employment and intellectual development. Slow asserted that, quote, 
The curriculum which is pursued by students in college must take account for the fact that they will, upon leaving college, enter a world torn by the most profound upheaval in history. The women students particularly must be prepared to shoulder the responsibility, first of all, for making a living, because they are definitely committed to the modern world, to developing their own individual talents, and of being responsible for their own lives." End quote. And so there's a constant notion of autonomy and self-determination and being able to have a certain kind of ownership of self that Slo is constantly reiterating and encouraging her students to think about. She openly criticized Howard, and this will be a theme of what she does while she's there, um, and other predominantly black colleges and universities. And I just make a note here, in my book, I often say predominantly black colleges and universities and historically white institutions. It's actually reversed because white institutions are historically rendered white. They are meant to be exclusionary, whereas most of these schools, and Howard, for instance, was a open admission school from its inception. So it was not historically black. In fact, the first graduating class of Howard University was five white women. Right? So to think about that idea of the way that, that in, in, it, it assumes a certain kind of power, right? that predominantly white schools are not predominantly white by accident. Right? They are actually historically constructed to be spaces populated by white people, whereas black colleges are predominantly black because they were historically established for the sons and daughters of recently freed slaves, right? So that's a flip that I do in my work, so you'll hear it sometimes in my work, but I like to mark that for people so they know that's an intentional um, demarcation. So when she criticizes, she criticizes them for not addressing the new needs of women. In a piece called, quote, The Colored Girl Enters College, What Shall She Expect? In the Opportunity Journal of Negro Life, Slow argued that, Quote, one of the most serious defects in the Negro college is the slowness with which it has recognized this need. This guidance is even more important for Negro women than it is for white women, because the former have to be guided not only with reference to their aptitude, but because of their racial identity, also with reference to possible opportunities for work. Negro women cannot assume that because they are prepared efficiently as individuals, they will receive the same considerations as others when they apply for work." End quote. So in this, she's doing a lot of significant work. Right? She's acknowledging the unique position of black women. She's acknowledging that in relationship to white women, but also in relationship to kind of this predominant notion of who gets employment of white men. But she's saying because of racial identity, this even looks different for black women compared to white women. She's also speaking to the narrative that's happening in college right now, in, in college, excuse me, at the time, that are saying that if you're going to college as a woman, you're going there to get your MRS, right? You're going there to find your husband, as opposed to a degree or this. And she's like, that can't be black women's experiences here, because unlike our kind of, well, most of us who are in college have to work once we leave here. This is not a choice. So we need to prepare to do that kind of work. So forcefully and adeptly recognize the unique challenges of black women faced during the new Negro era. So she continues to build in these ways. She is working towards building a women's campus because women are living off campus um, during this time. They don't have women's dormitories. They have to live in homes throughout the city and then can come to campus. And she wants to center that feeling that residential life will be an important part of strengthening black women's opportunities, right? Expanding black women's opportunities while they're there. And she is pretty successful to an extent in encouraging black women, developing organizations that are there, bringing speakers to campus, being involved in the women's suffrage movement, a lot of different political movements. She really galvanizes and gains a lot of support from black women, students, faculty, and staff while she's there. But a sudden shift happens around 1927, about five years after she arrives there. And it actually comes during the arrival of Howard University's first black president, Mordecai Johnson. Okay. Um, Mordecai Johnson arrives in 1926, but he becomes officially there in 1927. He's a graduate of the all-male Morehouse College and an ordained Southern Baptist minister. Mordecai Johnson arrived at Howard with a vision for the future of this institution and became known to many as one of the most controlling, although effective, presidents that the university ever had. His religious background influenced his views on education and his thoughts pertaining to the appropriate behavior and career paths for African-American women. 
Johnson maintained a conservative understanding of black women's roles on college campuses and more broadly in public life. And so he became someone who slow, and this is being light with it, detested um, over the course. And this is who she'd be negotiating with for the last 10 years of her life. Um, she, to give you a sense of how deep this hatred ran, in her notes before she died, she actually requested that he not be able to attend her funeral, which was held at Howard, right? That he couldn't attend, seek, or anything. So they had a very <laughs> intense relationship <laughs> throughout their tenure. Um, and uh, she spoke very openly uh, about her issues with him and with her issues with the administration largely, but also believed in the distinct potential of Howard University to be a space where progressive um, politics could be cultivated. So Slo explicitly critiqued African-American churches and social conservatism, which also put her at odds with this ordained Southern Baptist minister. She publicly stated, quote, much of the religious philosophy upon which Negro women have been nurtured has tended towards suppressing them in their own powers. Many of them have been brought up on the antiquated philosophy of St. Paul in reference to women's place in the scheme of things, and all too frequently have been influenced by the philosophy of patient waiting rather than the philosophy of developing their own talents to their fullest extent. Under these conditions, it is inevitable, therefore, that the psychology of most of the women who come to college is the psychology of accepting what is taught without much question, the psychology of inaction rather than that of active curiosity. Right? So she also is openly criticizing right, this kind of foundational space that is a part of Howard, right? this kind of religious philosophy, but also saying we see this internalization of these ideas that she's also trying to work with and unpack. So she forms a lot of these kind of student groups and meeting with students to start to unpack that because there are women who are coming in with these ideas. And she's like, let's be in dialogue about what this is and what this means. And you start to see language like sexism, um, and early things about the men of this, right? It's not quite uh, patriarchy that she's naming, but reading it through, right? The things that she's articulating are the kind of results of heteropatriarchy that she's critiquing very um, adamantly. Slow and Johnson, uh, in his all-male administration, maintained a contentious relationship that lasted until Slow's untimely death. Um, it has been intimated, her biographer intimates that um, it was unclear what actually happens, her body, failure that, that, that happens to her body as she passes, but it seems to be stress related. Um, so in the thing, it's argued that a lot of the kind of dynamics back and forth with Howard, the stresses of that were one of the contributing factors to her untimely death, um, which is an interesting precursor to the ways that we think about black women's health in the academy, um, and a lot of narratives about black women's health in the academy um, that stem from their conditions and stress and um, other factors. So it was interesting to kind of put that into a context um, for her. Additionally, in addition to having that level of antagonism with the administration, Slow shared a house and her life with a woman, Mary Burrell. The implications of these two adult women living together contradicted the university's value around appropriate gender and sexual roles and relationships. Although Sloan and Burrell perhaps benefited from the ambiguity of two unmarried women living together, everybody knew, right? Um, when Lucy Dick Slow passes, so many people send letters to Mary Burrell um, as her, the love of her life, as her soulmate. Um, very well-known people. Benjamin May sends a note, Du Bois sends a note, so it's very well-known that they are in a relationship. And because of this, um, Mordecai Johnson actually demands that Slow move back on campus so, and, and be a kind of matron over the women who are now on campus, that she needs to police them because we don't want these girls getting loose is a comment that is made here. Um, and it also is to regulate her relationship Right, um, so that she's monitored and surveilled in particular ways because she is sharing her life with this woman. Her concern for African American women's experiences at Howard, however, became glaringly evident in a complaint made by women students at Howard about a male professor in 1927. Slow received an initial complaint about Professor Clarence Harvey Mills from a parent in 1927. The letter accused Professor Mills of using improper and sometimes vulgar language in his classroom with women students. 
seeking to avoid a public controversy, Slow arranged to speak privately with Mills about the allegations. Slow noted in her writing that Mills responded positively to their meeting and actually thanked Slow for bringing it to his attention without involving the administration. However, the following day, Slow received a letter from Mills, which she described as vile. This letter accused the female student of hypocrisy, of spending too much time in brothels, and of pretending to be offended by the vulgar language Mills used in reference to her. His written reaction to the accusations attacked not just the character of his accusers, but also attacked Slow in her position as dean. Of Slow, Mills wrote, quote, you forget that you are merely the dean of women and not the custodian of morals of the male teachers of Howard University. He even, end quote, he even suggested that if Slow had the same responsibilities as her male counterparts, she would not be a, quote, receptacle for ridiculous complaints lodged at respected male faculty members. After receiving this letter, Slow shared what transpired from the initial complaint to this point with a professor um, and dean of the School of Liberal Arts and President Johnson. Woodard and Johnson agreed that both the parents' complaint and Mills' fiery letter to Slow warranted serious actions. During a meeting with Mills, it was decided that he would be dismissed at the end of the term, that no public discussion would accompany the administrative decision, and that Mills would apologize to Dean Slow for his scathing remarks about her. However, Mills finished the entire year at Howard and was granted a leave of absence with partial salary during the next academic year. During his leave of absence, Mills finished his doctoral degree at the University of Chicago and continued a career in education unmarred by his behavior towards Howard women. Mills' eventual departure from Howard was more voluntary than punitive. Slow's relationship with Howard's male administrators, particularly President Johnson, further deteriorated because of her continued insistence after this on Mills' termination and her advocacy against Howard women being subjected to gender-based harassment. These, the consequences in this further deterioration of a relationship, however, did not stop Slow from speaking out about campus culture. In her 1927 memorandum on the Mills case, she conveyed a profound sense of disappointment and frustration with Howard and its attitudes and policies towards black women. In this letter, she addresses sexual assault, but also addresses larger concerns about the treatment of women here at Howard. She said, quote, from the time this case happened down to the present, I have not had the cordial support of the president. When the time came to raise salaries, he raised mine $200 and raised other deans with qualifications no better than mine in amounts ranging from $850 to $1,150. He, without explanation, excluded me from his conferences with the academic deans, although prior to 1930, the dean of men and the dean of women had sat with the board of deans. He has never sympathetically studied the real work of the Dean of Women and still seems to have a wrong conception of her function, sponsored by the Department of the Dean of Women. And he does not have firsthand knowledge of my work. I have tried in every way to correct this, but can get no cooperation from the president." End quote. All right, so she writes this public letter. Soon after this, a few years after this, he actually closes the women's campus at Howard University, in addition to um, raises that are much lower than her counterparts, despite having higher qualifications or equal qualifications to her male counterparts, and actively begins attacking her in different means and modes um, throughout this. Despite all of this, Slow continues to be openly critical of the administration and the administration's attempt to regulate her sexuality and the behavior of black women on the campus. Furthermore, she becomes even more invested in black women on campus and their experiences outside of that. She continues to advocate for political opportunities, advocate for them being the kinds of leaders she was on campus, and also advocating for themselves. Right? A lot of this becomes a transition, not just of her thinking about where African American women's opportunities would be, but more concretely about a consciousness among these black women about what it meant to be prepared for the modern world. And although she remained critical of Howard throughout her tenure there, she had a deep and abiding love for what the space could create and could offer to black women such as herself. After all, she graduated from there 
about 15 years before she arrived there as the dean of women. She had a deep affinity for what it cultivated in her and believed that with black women at the helm of their training, that a shift could happen in the ways that they were learning about themselves and about their possibilities for the future. African American women at Howard University in the early 20th century were participants and, and catalysts in debates about the role of black women in the modern world. Although they combated less than progressive gender ideologies, it was important that they got exposed to different ideas about who they could be and different ideas about autonomy, different ideas about authoring of self. This is at the core of what a new Negro ethos was, a new Negro consciousness was among black women, an idea of self that was both tied to the possibilities of the individual, but intimately connect, excuse me, connected to the possibilities of the collective. What was possible when all of these black women actually could harness their individual talents in service of these greater political goals? How would they be equipped to challenge prevailing ideologies that were anti-black, that were anti-queer, that were anti-woman, that were anti-femme? Right? How would they use these skills here? And although Howard is this elite space in many ways, it is a space that is deeply connected to Washington, D.C., and is seen as part of the community, right? It doesn't have the same kind of divide that we often imagine colleges and universities having with the cities that they're in, right? It's actually very intimately interwoven. So performances from the high school are held at Howard, right? And students begin to imagine possibility. Also, Slow's partner is a teacher at the high school there. So the connections that are being made between the women there solidify a community of women that are shaping a city, but also shaping a consciousness. They're shaping ideas about justice that are deeply rooted in the unique experiences of black women, and therefore making Chocolate City also a femme-centered space. Thank you.